Welcome to the Ian Bounsfield Experience. I'm glad you're here. This series of podcasts are just things that come up in my mind when I'm thinking about playing, when I'm thinking about teaching, and general thoughts about music. There are some things here that I hope you'll find really useful. And don't forget, if you've got any comments or if there's anything you want to discuss further, go to ianbowsfield.com. I've received quite a lot of requests um, to discuss what style, authenticity and tradition is in uh, music. And obviously, this is an enormous uh, subject, so this may be part one. <laughs> or it may be the whole one, who knows? But here goes. So I want to start off by asking, what is style <clears throat> in music? What is tradition? Well, it's very similar to wine. Well, of course it would be. You can relate everything to wine, can't you? In wine, in France, they have something called terroir, the earth. And whereas in New World wines, you'll see the grape variety on the label. So you'll have an Oregon Pinot Noir, or you'll have, who knows, a Chenin Blanc from South Africa. In France, you won't see the grape variety name on the label very much at all. If you look at the uh, great wines of Burgundy and Bordeaux, the label says where the wine comes from. The grape variety is purely the vehicle of expressing the meaning of the earth. So, um, you know, a, a Pinot Noir from the north of Burgundy in gervais chambertin will have a completely different expression to a Pinot Noir in the south from Volnay. Um, and that goes for the different classifications in Bordeaux as well, of the Margaux, saint sf Saint-Julien, or Medox, or whatever. Anyway, I ramble on too much about my... Um, <laughs> My, passion, my other passions outside of music. And style and tradition is built up of the origins of the actual piece of music. I am, for better or worse, English. <laughs> Don't know how proud I am of that right now, but I am English. I am from the north of England. And I am a product of my environment and of the terroir in which I grew up, the society, the food, the culture that was already there. Now, the music that is composed anywhere, that human expression, comes from a human being with that same kind of terroir, the same kind of earth around them. They represent um, everything in their community, their society, their and their education. Um, so we can relate it very, very clearly, can't we, to um, English people listening to Elgar. Uh, it sort of brings out a certain feeling in you, you know, it's like, oh, it's English music. And then you hear a, an American orchestra or... or God forbid, a French orchestra playing Elgar, and you think, oh, no, it's not right. It doesn't sound right, because it doesn't have that terroir. It doesn't have the tradition, the style built up. Well, I'm not singling anyone out to pick on them, because that's what Americans think when someone plays Bernstein. Someone else plays Bernstein. That's what the French think when somebody else plays Ravel. And that's what the Germans and the Austrians think when we play, uh, oh, Mahler, Bruckner, Brahms, Beethoven, oh, Haydn, Mozart, uh, Berg, Schoenberg, you see where I'm going. Now, before we go any further, I would uh, like to say that I am a believer in style and tradition and identity. I love it. There are two approaches you can take. One is that a piece of music uh, is a blank piece of paper for you to write on any, on it anything that you want. Um, some people call that interpretation. I don't. Um, I believe in respecting the history and the traditions of a composer's intentions. 
and understanding what those intentions were and also in representing the sound world of that composer and also the sound world of the history of the, the music in that country. Um, a very good comparison is Shakespeare. Um, I personally like Shakespeare, no matter how it's done. You can set Shakespeare in a crack house in Brooklyn and um, it works extremely well, but I do prefer the original. So there's room for both opinions. As I say, I, I'm a believer in history and tradition and respecting the wishes um, of a composer. Now, there, there are some people who do like that um, white, the blank piece of paper. Um, there are several very high profile conductors who have said that what they like about conducting in America is it's a blank piece of paper. You go there, you're going to get basically a perfect representation of what's on the page. But you write on that piece of paper whatever you want. You can create any sound world you want, which is different to turning up to an orchestra in Europe, let's say, with a legacy of 100 years or more of a tradition of playing that piece of music. Um, in some cases, going right back to the origins of playing it with, with the composer. So why is it important? to respect style and tradition. It's important to respect it because the music sounds right if we do. It has what we call the ring of truth about it. Um, and this is where we tread onto the subject of original instruments, which I'm not going to go into here, but I'm happy to at a later, in a later podcast. If we play, let's say for example, Mahler, we all love Mahler. The reason why it's important to look at the historic instruments that were played at that time and to understand how they worked and how they sounded is so that we can understand what Mahler had in his head when he wrote that piece of music. Um, for me, the composer's intentions and sound world are holy, I do not consider myself worthy to change anything that a composer wrote. It's my job, my duty to understand what the composer intended. And by that, I don't mean interpreting. I mean, what did a trombone, what did it, in our case, what did a trombone sound like in Austria, in, in, um, in Germany in the 1880s, 1890s? And that doesn't mean to say that I think we should then automatically perform on those instruments. Um, that's another rabbit hole that we can go through down in a podcast. They don't believe that in order to get a um, historic, an exact historic performance, we must play on the original instrument. We can play in a historically informed way, which means we understand the instruments, how they reacted, the sound they made, and then take that into um, the sound that we wish to make on our modern instruments. So it's historically influenced historically informed. Now, why is that? You know me, I'm not a bloody academic. <laughs> That's the last thing I am. The reason why is I'm going back to this ring of truth thing again. If you do Verdi, Giuseppe Verdi, um, and it can be really bad music or it can be the most wonderful dramatic experience of your life Verdi is basically a great thing to take into an education project because it's a drone some chords and it's an engine a rhythmic figure and a melody over the top so you get some chords running then you get the violas going for 64 measures and then you get someone going on top of it and um, it's like, oh, come on, really? Until you do that with someone like Riccardo Muti, and all of a sudden, the violas, yes, ladies and gentlemen, the violas are going... And this, oh, this melody goes on, it's like, oh, oh, it's incredible. It's understanding the terroir, 
the meaning, the style, the idiom of that music. Do we have to be Italian to be able to do that? Italians would probably say yes. Um, but that would then mean that um, only English people could play Elgar and Americans really wouldn't have an awful lot to play at all. Um, no, it's not true. We can do that, but we must inform ourselves as to what the style and tradition is. So how do we do that? What I've initially, as I've said, is we need to go back and find out what the instruments were, how they would have sounded. Um, but the other thing is you have to, let's go back and listen to some old recordings. Um, Mahler is quite an easy one because we've got recordings going back into the 1930s um, in Vienna, in Dresden, in Berlin, conducted by people who knew Mahler and conducted his music um, while he was alive, friends of his. So that's a good insight basically as to how we should play. Now, am I saying that if you play Mahler, you have to copy the Vienna Philharmonic. Um, no. No. We take it, we take, we listen back to recordings, and we take it and we add to what we do. I don't think we can blindly run over the intentions. Of a conductor or a um, uh, an established style. Um, I once heard someone say, "Yeah, I got rid of all of my Vienna Philharmonic recordings because of the intonation," <laughs> and well, that was a long time ago. I have to say, I think that was about twenty years ago. Um, I. I uh, have to say, yes, there is some truth in that. If you listen back to the old recordings of the 40s, 50s, 60s, the Vienna Philharmonic's priorities are one, music, two, uh, music, uh, three, uh, music, four, yeah, try and get the notes, uh, five, hopefully in tune. That's their priority, and I bloody salute it because it's so rare these days. Now, of course, they're much better now, technically far, far superior now to what they were 50 years ago. It's, it's an incredible machine, as uh, any of us who heard the New Year's concert recently will, will, will testify. It's an incredible technical machine now, as well as the musical communication there is quite incredible. So, yes, particularly on, the, on, the, on, on our instrument, on the trombone, um, if you were to think of the historically famous trombone sections in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, I don't think any of us would have Vienna on, or Berlin on the list. However, ladies, gentlemen, boys and girls, this is the important point. It doesn't mean the style was wrong. It doesn't mean to say, oh, that's a lot of rubbish, we're just going to do our own thing. And I understand that's a difficult thing to differentiate. But... You know, yeah, it was not always really well. In these old historic performances, yeah, but what about the sound? What about the style? What about the articulation? This is historic stuff going back to, in some cases, some cases conducted by Richard Strauss, in some cases, you know, played by people who studied with people who played for him, etc., etc. We can't just close that out. Now, the really interesting thing, um, in my experience, as to how we actually go about playing music in authentic style is I always ask questions. You know, when, it, when I was in, uh, in the Halle Orchestra, you know, so how, how do you play Elgar to make it sound like that? And the old guys, the guys who were in the orchestra back in the time of Sir John Barber Ollie would say, well, look, Elgar is really simple. If you look at it, there's lots of articulations and markings that Elgar wrote in. All you have to do, and this is where people make mistakes, all you have to do to make Elgar sound like Elgar is play exactly what's written on the page. And then it sounds like Elgar. So then, uh, you know, you go to uh, the Vienna Philharmonic and you say, you know, this sounds like so uniquely Richard Strauss, Richard Strauss, how do you do this? And they say, well, 
yeah, it's, it's really it's a mistake a lot of people make when they do this. You see, it, if you just play exactly what's written on the page, it sounds like Strauss. And then to top it all, the Vienna Philharmonic has a Czech um, first bassoon player, Stefan Turnovsky, very nice man. And he, um, I used to share lifts with him, traveling to work sometimes. And I said, you know, how do you play Vojak? So it sounds like Vojak, because I just heard a, a, a Czech string quartet playing a Vojak string quartet, and it just, it made me cry. It was just, it, you know, it's like, how do they get into that incredible sound world? And I said, how do they do that? He said, guess what he said? He said, well, Vojak's really simple. You just play exactly what's written on the page. <laughs> now, what does that tell us? It's going back to my terroir, isn't it? A lot of the Vienna Philharmonic players and many orchestras know they have a style, but and, and they, they can't understand why no one else plays their music like that, but they don't identify or understand what it is. I think in order to understand it, you need to be a little bit like me, an outlier. I don't really, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm stateless musically because I've traveled so much. Um, and so what I did, I remember a couple of years into my time in the Vienna Philharmonic, we did a live recording of Mahler 5 with Christoph Eschenbach. And I was very happy with how I played. I thought I'd done a good job. And so, you know, I got the radio recording immediately and listened to it. And, uh, you know, I had played really well. It was great, you know. But something wasn't right. Somebody was sticking out in the brass section. It wasn't too loud. It wasn't a different articulation. Wasn't really even a different sound, but it was different. And that person was me. I sounded different because I hadn't been born and raised in that city. I hadn't appreciated what it was to be Austrian. I had not appreciated what it was in my personality. In in, in our sorry, I nearly broke into German. And in our in our German. DNA, our Germanic core, what it was to be Viennese. When we play Elgar as English people, it's like, what is it to be? What does this mean to be English? And I think the mistake that we make in this thing about style and tradition is the wonderful thing about music, the thing that makes it so appealing to us and makes it so magical is to understand what it is to be French in the time of Ravel, what it is to be American at the time of Copeland, and to really represent that. And that is one part of the musical understanding that is missing if we don't do that. So that would lead me on to another um, podcast um, called Music, the Universal Language. Ha ha, my backside it is. <laughs> so there we have it. That did turn out to be episode one. Coming soon, episode two, when good style and tradition turns bad. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed that. If there are any issues that you found particularly interesting, don't forget to contact me and always go to uh, ianbowsman.com for lots more interesting stuff.